is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the founder and publisher of Unwinnable. When he told me today we were talking about marches, I said, like, left, right, left, Stu Horvath. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> That's all I know about, like, marching, you know? <laughs> Taught me that in, like, kindergarten gym class. Today we're going to march. It's like, well, can we play dodgeball, Mr. Gym Teacher? It's like, no, we're going to march. Left, left. Left, right, left. You know, my God, your school was intense. Listen, my grammar school was must up in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, you know, I had like the comically evil, like substitute kindergarten teacher. Like we had like a really nice kindergarten teacher. I don't remember what the circumstance was, but for like a brief period of time, she just couldn't be there. And we had this like nasty old coot called Miss Butchko and I'll never forget Miss Butchko because we were learning penmanship and I did a very bad job um, writing Z's you know Z for zebra for our Canadian friends and uh, (laughs) she like tore me a new asshole in front of the entire class now mind you like I'm kindergarten age I'm like a little kid and like oh man she made me cry so hard and then uh, she laid into me so hard in kindergarten that everybody else cried too because they were so upset because it you know she was so mean and not even to them but she they Man. knew they knew if they didn't get those z's tight she was coming for them next <laughs> it ain't like that anymore man no you can't do that kind of shit anymore no. it's really kind of nice <laughs> i mean good lord like nothing short of like physically slapping me you know and then uh it was it was like something in the air at that school because i remember you know in the fourth grade i mean we're, we're going deep into like the psychological uh aspect of my my life here uh dear listener <laughs> but th- i'm going somewhere with this so you know you had the gym teacher who's like we're gonna march today instead of doing anything remotely fun you had miss butchko who like made me cry it made the entire room cry for that matter um because we we're bad at penmanship in kindergarten. And then uh, we had this uh, music teacher and he I'm not going to say his name because he still might be alive. Miss Butchko. I mean, if she's not dead by now, she's a lich. But, <laughs> uh, he was a complete asshole to everybody, like to the point where like, you know, we you know, every kid in like these grammar schools, they have like the chorus thing they have to do. They have to do like the show for their parents and whatever, singing yeah. songs that they would normally never sing. It's it's miserable. Um, and so I remember like we, we we just couldn't get the timing right. I couldn't even tell you what song we're doing. We just couldn't get the timing right. So we are maybe in the third grade and there was this really mean teacher who was the fourth grade teacher who she was like the overseer of the safety patrol. For those who may not be familiar with the safety patrol, I don't even <laughs> know if they still do it, but it's always like that. The kids who were like narcs who would like get these like orange sashes and would have to like narc out other kids for like doing bad things or like tell people not to run the hallways. But she was like, you know, the the chief of the police for the safety patrol. And uh, she was mean and like everybody was scared of her. But one day we're in this this the music class in the in the gymnasium that also had the stage. That's how the, the school was built. It was in Clifton School 8. And uh, fucking we're up there. We're, we're just not getting the timing right. And and this music teacher, I come to find out years later, he's just a failed musician. You know, and they, <laughs> you know how they say those who can't teach like he is like the textbook definition of this. So he starts laying into everybody and like, you know. Just shit talking all of us. And yes, we're going to have to make this episode explicit, but whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I don't have therapy this week. It's on you guys now. So he's laying oh, into shit. all of us. <laughs> and uh, my one buddy, Will, he was a he was a, a Boy Scout. He was actually in uniform because, you know, at that point, you're not going home after school. You're going right to Boy Scout. So he's dressed in his Boy Scout uniform, got a little kerchief and everything. <laughs> and. I remember specifically, he's like laying into everybody and Will starts to get upset. And he looks at Will. He's like, don't cry. He's like, you're going to cry. He's like, you're a Boy Scout. He's like, if you cry, you're a disgrace to that uniform. God. Like, you know, you think about like, you know, there are a lot of parents who listen to the show. And you you hear these horror stories and you think to yourself, man, like, you know, 
you may feel a certain way about like the way schools conduct themselves with your children now. And, and that like, you know, some may even think that schools are really soft on the kids, but man, if you think about what happened to you when you were younger versus what happens now in schools, you're going to be really grateful. So I walked out, I just split. I was, I was upset. I left and, uh, a scary fourth grade teacher saw me and she's like, what's going on? Why are you crying? And I told her and she took me into the library. Another friend of mine came out to check on me. Uh, this one girl named Angela, she was super tough and she was like, you know, making sure I was okay. And I remember the teacher looking at Angela. She's like, you stay with him. She's like, and she got me like a juice box and she's like, I'll be right back. So she leaves the library, which is a full half hallway away from where the music room gymnasium is. I hear a door slam and I hear this woman screaming and <laughs> and just she ripped this man apart, like eviscerated him down to a cellular level, like to the point where he got ripped apart for her. I look out the door of the library and I see her literally digging her claws into his arm, dragging him from the room into the principal's office. Like she just left the kids unsupervised, but they're all following her because they're just standing outside watching this woman. Now she laid into this guy so bad. The principal had to like call her off. Um, But she was a hero from then on out. Like she had broken kayfabe. We, everyone was like, yeah, she's mean, but she's nice to us. So we love her. She became like this beloved woman uh, and teacher. (laughs) So he, you know, then of course he got fired or moved to another school because you didn't get fired for abusing children back then. But yeah, Yeah, uh, uh, I will send my shit show. Yeah, and I will be sure to send my copay out to each and every one of you. Thanks for listening. (laughs) But yeah, that's that's how I I learned about marching. That's the the long winded. You wanted longer episodes, so yeah, this this is what you get. get. (laughs) Careful what you wish for, folks. (laughs) So tell everybody about what March is. Well, no, I got I got to add a couple points. One, uh, so my my elementary school experience was much uh, less awful. Um, it was still pretty bad. I feel like 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 there was there was crummy stuff, but like nothing on that level. I just wanted to point out that in my school, the safety patrols uh, literally just helped the crossing guards in the morning, they helped kids cross the street. That was it. There was no there was no secret police. <laughs> so done. Yeah, yeah. The music teacher and not the music teacher in the school, the band director felt that the drummers could never keep time. Uh, so she kept drumsticks at the podium. And when they could not keep time, she threw a drumstick at whoever the culprit was. Jesus. <laughs> Which was terrifying. <laughs> like, yeah. So like, it, like that's a like, that's a that's a missile. <laughs> You would be run out of town for even like looking sideways at a kid now. Forget about it. It's completely different now. It, it like you said, it, it it's frustrating. It's it sometimes in different ways, but like at least like I don't think that my kids get traumatized. Yeah, I mean, my lord. Anyway, anyway, uh, West marches. <laughs> yeah, so we're not talking about a specific book uh, this time. We're actually going to talk about a mode of play. Kind of specifically for D and D, but I guess you could use it for for any kind of um, nah. Who am I kidding? This is a D and D thing. <laughs> yeah, like like it'd be really hard to make Call of Cthulhu into West Marches. I mean, you could, but the idea is that it's a different way of applying the uh, explore, uh, encounter, and you know, loot loop that D and D sort of thrives on, kind of re- recontextualizing it in a really interesting way. The term was coined by uh, Ben Robbins, who uh, you might know as the author of Kingdom and Microscope, which are very world building kind of abstract games, which I like a lot uh, conceptually. So I was sort of surprised that he had like this really important approach to D&D. He applied the Western Marches when third edition came out. He ran uh, a longstanding third edition campaign, and I guess it came about because he had a lot of people who were interested in playing. So the idea is that it is on-demand dungeon mastering. You have a pool of people who have gone west, the furthest point west of the civilized lands, and they're living in in a town that is directly on the frontier. Beyond that is ruins and monsters and all sorts of weirdness. Behind them, back east, is civilization retirement, boredom, nothing interesting happens back there. The only thing that's interesting is to the West in that frontier. The other key thing is that the player characters are the only people in the world who are weird enough or broken enough to think that going into the frontier looking for treasure is a good idea. 
there's no other parties. There are no other really high level NPC types out there. There's no such thing as other adventurers. It really is just the wackadoos in the party who are willing to go sort of treasure hunting. And the idea is that that you have a, a hex map of however many hexes, and you have a group of players, and they know a certain amount of information through just talking in town and making their character and, and, and such that they have a vague sense of what's out there. And there are some some adventure locations that are known to them uh, through reputation, and they decide when they play. So as the DM, you know, you've made up all of the spaces, you, you've fleshed out your 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 hex map, you, you have your random encounters all set up, uh, you have an idea of what's where, who's doing what, uh, and then you have a whole bunch of dungeons that you've made pre-anything. You're not worried about story, you're just worried about creating environments. Uh, those environments might tell a story through discovery, what players may find here and there, and they might piece things together. But you're not trying to come up with a like an overarching plot line. Like our campaign was like very plot heavy. The idea here is to let the players decide when they want to play and then they go do something. Now, again, large group of players, you know, more than a dozen. Uh, so not everybody's going to be playing all at the same time. So there has to be some sort of hub, which, you know, in, in the real world would be like a like maybe like a like a website or something that, that everybody would would be able to have access to uh that would have you know a copy of the map and and all of the uh the adventure logs of previous expeditions uh and you know somebody would say oh well the uh that ruined tower man we've nobody's ever gone there and i, I kind of feel like like going to the ruined tower who else wants to go we're gonna go check that thing out it's been hanging out there uninvestigated too long and then bob and harry and bill are all like yeah let's do it and then they hit up the DM and say, hey, how about Wednesday, 9 a.m. or 9 p.m.? DM, if he, he's free, he's like, all right, let's do it. Now, they go off, they leave town, and they have their adventure. And at the end of the adventure, they come back. And it, it, they're single session, and there's a whole bunch of, like, there's a lot of information on Western marches uh, that, that people have come up with. There, there's all these contrivances of how to limit exploration to a single session. I'm not even going to get into that. That's That's high-level stuff. I haven't figured that out but the idea is that they go they explore for a certain amount of time and then they come back and they report their findings so that everybody who didn't go with them is immediately jealous <laughs> because oh man they found this cool sword oh man they found this mysterious door that they couldn't open oh man they ran into a dragon that didn't go well you know like and, and because there is no um there's no scaling. There's no, no, uh, basically like, like, because the players can go wherever they want, they could go someplace that's super deadly. You kind of have to roadmap that a little bit, you know, signpost it with like tracks or some indication that the environment is, is, uh, something that they might not be able to account for or deal with. But really, it's up to the players so they can get into much more trouble than they expect. And they report back and that everybody wants to. So everybody's okay. Well, every, I'm going to go check out the you know the next day like a whole a whole different group of people's like well okay we want to go check out the tower see what these other yahoos missed and we're going to kill that dragon or we're going to open that door or we're going to you know whatever right um and it's just like like it creates this fear of missing out that really fuels play a whole lot of work for a dungeon master in the front end but as the games kind of go um it's really the players drive it and then you know, the DM kind of sits back and really just does basically as little as possible in terms of inserting themselves. It's just the, the, like because everything's already made, you know, you run the combats and stuff, but like you don't have to worry about like NPCs and agendas and like driving characters here or there. Like they're the players themselves will make up the story as they go along. And as a, an engine for a large group of players, I've I've been long interested in this it harkens back to an earlier time i think when the original guys would run games with like 20 people around the table which is crazy this sort of like waves your hand at that idea of a world that's populated by a whole bunch of people who are running around adventuring but sort of breaks it into a much more realistic and manageable style of play uh, that i think is super interesting yeah my, my my takeaways from this i think are um in no particular order yeah i mean running 20 dudes with original D, &D you know you're going in there knowing you might not make it you might be sitting be on grinding. your hands for half of the episode you know yeah. 
just waiting for your buddies to wrap up. Hopefully they got Mountain Dew and you've got something <laughs> to do while you're waiting. Maybe read a comic book. I don't know. Uh, West March is, is a pretty fun idea because I love the fact that you are a DM at the start, but more of a referee throughout. So you yeah. get to casually enjoy the experience more because for anyone who has run any type of game, you know that the role of the Dungeon Master, the Game Master, the Keeper of Secrets, is always a little more, a little bit more heavy lifting than, say, being a player. Yeah. Because you, you have to account for a lot of moving parts. I do enjoy the fact that this is like FOMO, the RPG, where it's like <laughs> you really want to play, but if you don't play, but then find out your buddy went to the tower and got eaten by a dragon, you're like, yeah, you know what? That's okay. Because Tuesday didn't really feel like a good day to die. And then, you know, you're hoping that you go back and the dragons like softened up. So I think that's got a nice little layer to it, a nice little aspect to it. And I also really do enjoy that the players really get to dictate where the story goes, that you are not privy to a module or a dungeon master's agenda and story points that they feel they need to hit in order to get you from A to B, like on a hex, you, there is no straight A to B. You're gonna move in whatever direction you see fit, and I, that's a that's a pretty, pretty cool thing, man. I I definitely, now that I know what it is, I definitely enjoy the idea of what you're gonna accomplish in this game a lot more. Yeah. So and narratively, like I think, and I think that this might be the the deep dark secret of a West Marches game is that like, as the dungeon master, you're you're, you're populating these areas with things that are interesting. But you're not worried about what they mean. The players bring meaning to it. And then as they discuss these things, it, it's like Lost, right? Like we always right. have suspected that all these mysteries that were, were so fascinating about Lost that we're theorizing about, that the writers were literally watching us on the internet theorize about it and building the show to, to, to sort of appease that. Uh, and I think something similar kind of happens naturally with West Marches. The DM listens to what the players are making of this and then starts seeding specific things to to address that and, and create character arcs. That's all player driven. It is like like it's not just like like we're picking a game night to explore something. The players wind up driving everything naturally through play. And I think that that's just a super interesting, super different way to play. And it really can only work with a lot of people playing periodically it's really brilliant the reason we're talking about this and why i'm so interested in this is because i i've long wanted to do this and i am now setting up a west marches game for patrons starting soon of course i can't leave anything alone so i nope. have changed some of the stuff of but course for instance i have a real hard time conceptually arranging the the hex so that you're you're pointed west <laughs> So I have it so that they're starting on the, on the westmost side and marching east, left to right, because that I can't. Makes sense. I can't. I can't. I just can't do it the other way. So they are technically marching east instead of just you know showing up at this place. Um, they're escaping something. Uh, we haven't really decided what that something is yet, but they've fled east, and they have. Basically, I'm going to have like a, a settlement or village or fortress building component of the thing because I wanted to test out these weird mechanics that I've come up with for obligations. It's like a like a, a bunch of tables, basically, that another player rolls for you and it saddles you with something that you kind of have to attend to uh, because everybody is fleeing. Uh, they have other people that, that they're bringing. They have, you know, important objects from their, their their previous lives that they have to bring or they have like uh, traumas that they have to reckon with. Like getting yelled at by a music teacher? Kind of. Yeah. It's just like 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 <laughs> you might have like uh, been a coward or uh, you killed somebody in anger or, or like like stuff like that. It, it, like there's very small uh, mechanical impacts to like, like some of them like there's curses. Uh, that'll like like give you a minus one to a savings throw or like uh, you, there's things that give you pluses to your hit points, but it's like literally plus one hit point. Very, very minor mechanics. But I wanted to kind of like see if there was a mechanical way to kind of like have folks invest in the community that they're building together. Right. Um, without just like making the, the building sort of like like as a video game where it's just like okay you've built the forge now all your weapons are plus one you know like i didn't want it to be purely mechanical like that i wanted to sort of find mechanics that that 
built narrative. So there's that. But other than that, you know, I'm going to try and run. Uh, I think we got 13 or 14 people in there uh, currently, and uh, we'll see what happens with it. I think that it's uh, and listener right now. I'm talking directly to you. If you want to play something like that, you can sign up to our patron. Just poof, be in there. Uh, we're using OSC uh, and, you know, that's fun. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we do for our patrons at certain tiers is we run RPGs for you. So right now I'm finishing up a 5E RPG. And then uh, next month, in the month of June, actually, it's just we just got to May. God. Oh, crap. Okay, so later in the month of May, uh, I'm actually going to start running uh, Call of Cthulhu. So uh, stay nice. tuned for that. You know, uh, one of the things I, I appreciate about what we're talking about today, and I definitely think it's actually very timely because you mentioned Lost before. Now... We are in the myths. When you hear this episode, I'm confident that it's not going to be over, but we're in the midst of the writer strike, the WGA uh, writer strike, Writers Guild of America. Oh, that kicked off. I, I, I didn't even realize that. So that that kicked off like a day ago at midnight. So it's it is still super fresh from when we're actually recording this episode. However, you know, you talk about Lost. Uh, Lost was affected by the first writer strike back in 2008. That's true. And, you know, we have on good authority from from people that we know in the industry that lost was not only, you know, the, the writers were definitely like, like trying to figure out wh how to follow these threads. Cause they kept like throwing all the spaghetti at the wall and then taking everything that stuck and putting it in the show. But it also suffered because right when they started getting a clear path, <laughs> they had to stop writing. They had to put the pencils yeah. down because that, that was the first writer strike, which, you know, back in the day, 2008, like there was no AI. So it wasn't like they they were competing and concerned about streaming services and AI. And of course, we stand in solidarity with all the workers uh, trying to get a fair wage when they're writing all these shows and movies that we love and the things that make us happy and the things that we watch on these streaming services. So, you know, of course, we're with them on that. However, it's interesting that, you know, you, you bring it back to you know, the thing with loss and the comparison to loss, because like, you know, everything that's old is new again. And so here we are back, essentially, you know, where we were in 2008, except now when you do it, you have that lost style of storytelling with these players in this West Marches game. So a uh, very cool little parallel, I think. Yeah. And a happy May Day to everybody. Yeah, it is May Day. Yeah. Well, a couple days ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, we're past the point where someone's going, it's going to be May, you know, so it's we're 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 fully now I realize that we're fully engrossed in the month of May. So, yeah, definitely call it Cthulhu a little later this month, everybody. You'll nice. hear about it on the Patreon. So this is cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Um, I definitely see the the chat thread where people are talking about it. So now I understand it better. Very excited for everyone getting to play. So do you any final thoughts on West Marches? Not yet. I'm sure I will. Uh, in in the coming coming weeks we're going to do a session zero soon to set up everybody's obligations uh and generally make sure that everybody's characters are up to snuff so if you want to join uh maybe do it this week uh but we'll be taking players whenever uh i'm sure they're all going to die that's the other thing is that west marches tends to be fairly deadly especially when you're running you know OSE, which is just BX, which like all these one first level characters have like one and two hit points. It's hilarious. As I said, a hard fart, hard fart will kill you. Yeah, OSC. yeah. But I, I will update. Uh, I'll let I'll let everybody know how the grand experiment is going. You know me, I, I can't help running my mouth. It's kind of a thing. We kind of have a show dedicated to us running our mouths about <laughs> tabletop RPGs. So this is another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast, complete with therapy uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> in the very beginning of the episode. Stu, where can people find you on the internets? They can find me on Instagram uh, at Vintage RPG. I'm just thinking to myself because I didn't, you know, this isn't pinned to a book. I have no idea how we're going to illustrate this for, you know, the art for the posts, but well, I'll figure something out. Oh, man, we live in such a visual era. I know. We can phone <laughs> it in if we have to. Yeah. Uh, you can find me across the internet at John McGuire RPG. Uh, I even started a sub stack. I don't know why. I think I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm 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 a very big proponent of trying new things and seeing what sticks and trying to I don't know find new ways of communicating that I'm probably not going to stick to but you never know so subscribe to my Substack John McGuire RPG um, that's me across all social media if you like the show don't forget to rate review and subscribe your reviews really do help other listeners to find us if you really like the show want to become a patron 
patreon.com slash vintage rpg now we have early release episodes that come out on some point on friday depending on when we actually uh record the episode during the week uh we like to keep it fresh also we record them like one at a time so you know now you know we have a killer discord community that we'd love to be part of we run games for patrons in certain tiers we got a behind the scenes look at Stu's book and everything else that he writes or will be writing, uh, we're definitely showing off uh, there on the Patreon. And uh, we got a behind the scenes look at 3 2 1 action, including some stuff that uh, may or may not get released. Uh, I definitely put out a, uh, a zombie rule zine, so I don't know what I'm doing with that yet, but it's there. And that's the only place it is. So, patreon.com slash vintage RPG. So, for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com.